Hello and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Mass Transit and sponsored by May Mobility. This presentation is both live and interactive, so you can ask a question at any time via the ask a question box in the presentation window. We will answer as many of these questions as time allows at the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, just type your issue in the ask a question box and a member of our team will assist you. If you're running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view the webinar. In addition, it's recommended that you close down all other applications for better performance. For your convenience, this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email will be sent to all registrants containing a link uh, to the presentation for on-demand viewing. It will also be accessible from masstransitmag.com forward slash webinars. Additionally, the slide deck that you will see shortly will be available for download in the event resources tab. Today's presentation, Pathways to Success for Autonomy and Public Transit, Arlington's Journey with May and Via will be a team effort. First, we'll hear from Ann Foss, Transportation Planning and Program Manager for the City of Arlington, Texas, who is responsible for both long-range transportation planning and policy for the city and for implementing innovative transportation solutions. Next up, we'll hear from Megan Grella, Associate Principal, Autonomous Mobility Strategy with VIA. Megan and her team design turnkey autonomous services to meet local transit needs, build customized tools for riders and safety operators, and partner with leading AV manufacturers. Following Megan will be Daisy Wall, Director of Government Business at May Mobility. Daisy sees uh, business development, sales, policy, and advocacy. Uh, and I'm going to read this directly from her bio because I thought it was great. Her days are filled with forging partnerships, filling transportation gaps for those who need it most, advising on policy and regulatory issues, and working with industry leaders to reshape the evolving AV landscape. So without further delay, I will turn the call over to Anne. Anne, take it away. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, and I'm excited to be part of this panel and discussion today. Um, so we're going to dive right into kind of our case study of Arlington, Texas. Um, and I'm going to start off with a little bit of context, talk about our, our broader transportation um, kind of landscape here in Arlington, and then uh, go quickly into the details about our autonomous vehicle deployment with VIA and May. So Arlington, Texas, um, we're the 50th largest city in the United States. We've got just under 400,000 people spread out over 99 square miles. And we're located in north central Texas between Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, and we have not had any traditional public transit transit in the past. Uh, however, we do have a lot of transportation needs. We have a large entertainment district where the Dallas Cowboys and the Texas Rangers play, um, as well as a large University of Texas at Arlington campus with over 40,000 on-campus students. So with all of those transportation needs uh, and no clear path for traditional public transit, we got creative. Um, in Arlington. And about five years ago, we launched an on-demand rideshare service in partnership with VIA. Uh, we started off small and have expanded incrementally. Now we cover our entire city and make a connection to a regional rail stop just outside the city limits. Um, we run Monday through Friday as well as Saturdays. Um, and then our fare ranges between three and five dollars per person per ride, depending on the distance traveled. We really wanted to make sure that this service was accessible to folks. Um, so you can book through VIA's app or through call center. Um, you can also pay with credit, debit, or prepaid cards to allow people to use cash for rides. And we also have a variety of um, weekly and monthly pass programs as well as free ride programs to help out folks who need that. Uh, and then we have a fleet of 68 six-passenger vans, 14 of which are wheelchair accessible, fully ADA compliant. So to date so far, we've provided over 1.4 million rides on this service, and we have over 150,000 people who have set up accounts. Um, and there's a little map in the, the lower right of your screen there that shows all of our drop-off locations, and you can really see the amazing amount of access that this type of service provides. We've got uh, locations across the entire city where people are being able to be picked up um, kind of when they need to and, and get to where they need to go. So that's the broader context for our transportation in Arlington. 
Um, and now I'm going to move into the AV side of things and talk about our Arlington rapid deployment. Um, and this is actually our third AV deployment in Arlington. We did an off-street deployment, then an on-street circulator route. But we always wanted to find a way to integrate AV into our broader rideshare service. So that's what we've done with Rapid. We launched this in March of 2021, and we were very fortunate to receive $1.7 million in funding from the Federal Transit Administration's Integrated Mobility um, Innovation Grant Program. So we partnered with VIA and May Mobility, um, as well as the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, we operate in about a one square mile area that includes the UT Arlington campus and our downtown core, which has a lot of residential, um, commercial, civic, cultural destinations. Um, and the, the May Mobility AVs are fully integrated into the VIA platform. So you, when you go to book a ride through VIA, either the app or the call center, if the parameters of your ride meet the AV um, service area, you're offered a standard human-driven van as well as an AV uh, service. So to do this, we had a fleet of five AVs. We used four Lexus SUVs uh, that were hybrid electric and one Polaris gym that was fully electric and could carry a wheelchair passenger. We did have a human operator behind the wheel at all times for this deployment. And that was enabled us to meet one of our key goals as a city, which is um, helping expose our residents and visitors to AV service, getting them feeling comfortable with it, being able to ask questions, learn about the technology, we think really helps with um, acceptance of this new technology. Um, and so I want to share a couple of slides on some of our performance data and, and ridership um, demographics. So. In our first year, which was funded by FTA, ran March of 21 through March of 22, we gave over 28,000 rides. You can see we started off kind of slow, averaging um, around 35 or 40 rides a day, and then at our peak got close to 200 rides a day on average. So um, a lot of great ridership growth and acceptance. Uh, we had really good service quality performance. So ETAs ranged within 10 to 15 minutes for these on-demand rides. On-time percentages were very high. We tracked acceptance very carefully. Like I mentioned, you always had the option to choose a human-driven vehicle or one of the AVs. And we saw acceptance rates between 75 and 90%. So people were really happy opting into this service. Um, we also had good sharing of our fleet, um, high levels of autonomy, even in this very complex complex operating environment, and um, last but certainly not least, no safety incidents or accidents of any kind. And then finally, just a little bit about our um, ridership base. They were very satisfied with the service. 96% um, of riders reported feeling safe. 97% of riders reported wanting to ride the service again. And this was based on a, a voluntary survey that we conducted in partnership with UT Arlington. Um, we also looked at some demographics that showed our riders primarily came from an underserved uh, group. So um, minority, low income, lack of access to a personal vehicle. So we're very pleased to see that this service was able to offer another uh, transportation option uh, for those who needed it. So I'm going to wrap up here and transition things over to Megan to talk about VIA's perspective, but looking forward to coming all back together for more discussion as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anne, and thanks to everyone for including VIA on this panel. We're, we're excited for this conversation. I'll just do a quick overview of, of who VIA is and what we've been doing in our role in the autonomous mobility landscape, um, and then talk a little bit more about our technology um, and highlight a few specific AV deployments we have with our partner, May Mobility, um, to make it a little more tangible. So VIA is a transportation technology company, and our mission is to expand access to efficient, affordable, and accessible transportation. Our solution includes technology to power the entire life cycle of an advanced transit system, with our bread and butter technology being on-demand microtransit. So the algorithms, as well as consumer-facing tools to power shared demand-responsive fleets for public transit. And we provide this technology to our partners who include cities, transit agencies, transit operators, schools, and universities like the city of Arlington. And it's been used in over 600 communities in more than 40 countries around the world to power over 100 million rides to date. 
Aligned with our broader VIA mission, we seek to enable autonomous vehicles to provide efficient, affordable, accessible transit services. And we believe that the way to do so is by deploying AVs as shared on-demand microtransit, deeply integrated with existing public transit networks. Uh, an approach that is distinct from AVs that are deployed as private ride hail or private vehicle ownership. And over the past several years, we've deployed AVs for mass transit around the world to provide tens of thousands of autonomous rides on public roads in mixed traffic settings, including several with our partner, May Mobility, including in Arlington, Texas, as Anne mentioned, as well as in Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids, Michigan, and as of officially today in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. I'll talk a little bit about how, um, so how we leverage our core transit technology to do so. Um, and, and as mentioned, we use our same uh, standard transit technology, but we adapt it specifically for the autonomous driverless context. And we partner with leading AV manufacturers like May Mobility to specifically deploy autonomous vehicles. So very simply, what we would normally communicate to a driver app, we do so directly to the vehicle itself. In addition to our dynamic ride booking, assignment, and routing algorithms, our platform includes several consumer-facing tools. So for example, the rider app, which enables riders to book trips in real time and communicate with customer support at any time for any reason, as well as track vehicle updates um, in real time. It also includes an in-vehicle screen, which provides trip information and updates for riders as they are inside the vehicle, and a safety operator app, which enables safety operators, while they are still required in autonomous vehicles today, to communicate with riders or operators for any reason. And then finally, it includes an operation center, which is a one-stop shop for service management and includes everything from live service monitoring to robust data and analytics. And as mentioned, we equip our technology with features specifically designed for the driverless context. So in the slide here, we show a few um, uh, screenshots of our rider app. And you'll see that in the second screenshot, there's the option to book multiple rides. So there could be a ride option in an autonomous vehicle or in a conventional vehicle. And this is the case in Rapid that Ann talked about. And then you'll also see in the last two screenshots, we enable riders to verify their booking through QR code scanning. And this allows us to make sure that the right riders are boarding the right vehicles without any safety operator intervention. To close, I'll just briefly talk about what this technology looks like in actual operations on the ground. So Anne did an incredible job detailing what we're doing in Rapid. Um, and I would just add that this is the first service in the US to integrate AVs into an existing on-demand microtransit service. So what this means is that using the same rider app, the same rider account, the same payment methods, riders can book from a May Mobility autonomous vehicle or from a conventional vehicle. And the service zone for AVs is nested, the purple zone here, within the broader via Arlington zone, which is the blue zone here. I think this is a good example emphasizing that when services are properly designed and optimally utilized demand responsive technology, we can actually get people where they need to go. As Anne mentioned, the service has provided over 30,000 autonomous rides um, in, in almost a year, 70% of which were to or from essential destinations. So places like employment, education, or medical facilities. Um, and it also has allowed us to generate repeat loyal ridership because riders find the service not only useful in terms of getting them where they need to go, but also convenient, easy to use, accessible. And we're seeing averages of 13 rides per rider and very high rider satisfaction rates. Another service um, that VIA partnered with May Mobility on is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And this was a nine month pilot. I think this is an interesting use case of demand responsive technology because we transitioned the service from a previous fixed route service to a fully on-demand service, 
which allowed us to increase the service zone size from one to over four square miles and decrease rider wait times by almost 50%. I'll also mention our service with May Mobility in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, aside from really exciting usage stats um, and rider satisfaction stats, I think what's interesting here is the model of deployment allows us to deploy services quite quickly. So in fact, Ann Arbor was the third service that May and VIA jointly deployed in a period of under eight months. And then finally, I'll talk about very quickly Go Marty, which as mentioned, launched today. And I think Daisy might talk a little bit about this in further detail. Um, but this highlights the usage and functionality of on-demand microtransit, specifically in rural communities. Um, and as essential to enabling rural communities to reliably depend on public transit to ask, access schools, jobs, healthcare, and critical um, destinations. Our tech here is our core on-demand technology, but it also includes features that help us remediate challenges sometimes faced specifically in rural areas. So this includes accessibility features that help promote equity, such as the multiple booking options. So riders can book via the rider app or they can dial in uh, through phone bookings. It also allows for customized service options. So riders can specifically request a wheelchair accessible vehicle in the rider app or when they dial in by phone. Um, we also use robust mapping data. So we leverage both Google Maps and VIA's own proprietary maps to minimize map gaps, which are sometimes found in rural areas. Um, and we also have the ability for drivers to report mapping issues. So to remediate mapping gaps long-term. And then finally here, we also have an offline mode, which enables the service to continue and function even when there might be no broadband connectivity. So I will pause here um, and hand it over to Daisy. Awesome. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the generosity of your time um, today. And um, what, what I really wanted to start here is why are we doing what we're doing? And, you know, autonomy has come a long way. It's really interesting. Um, Misha and I were just talking a little bit earlier about there seemed to be five years ago this big promise that, you know, autonomy would come and it would change everything. And it, it really has been in the last two years that we feel like um, the technology has accelerated substantively and that we're really seeing um, deployments on the ground and really reaping the benefits from a community perspective. But I wanted to just start off here with why we're doing what we're doing. And I think in a lot of ways, we, we really need to align autonomy with what matters to the community and also what matters to public transit agencies. And so a lot of people ask, you know, where do we start if we want to look at autonomy? And we say, start with the people. Where do life gaps exist right now? Um, so, for example, very similarly, how you would look at a transit service area, are there transit deserts? Are there areas of development that are maybe outside of the city that really need to be connected back in? You know, are there um, areas where there's new growth, you know, for um, entertainment districts, but also areas that have been, you know, woefully neglected that um, we can bridge into to really help bridge those equity gaps? And so core metrics such as, you know, safe, accessible, reliable and affordable, right, are huge. And I think as we design technology for autonomy, we go back to those key areas. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that in a couple of slides here. In addition to that, really looking at how can we improve everyone's independence and dignity in terms of being able to allow them to get to where they need to go without having to rely on loved ones and, you know, and in as a convenient, you know, and accessible manner as possible. You know, how can we enhance quality of life and positively transform communities and align autonomy um, approaches to what cities really want, right? And what demographics really want and how can we make that happen? And then the last thing, which I think is, is it's really a challenge for the industry right now, but one that um, that is being worked on fairly aggressively is how can we make this economically and operationally sustainable over time? Um, you know, we've been very fortunate and um, we've even seen with these releases of the SMART grants and the ATTAIN grants that's happening right now, you know, as, as we're talking, um, that there has been an interest from, you know, USD and FTA, which we're 
um, very grateful for. But how do we how do we make things um, sustainable and make them programs that can complement the bigger um, transit ecosystem, and not just a pilot project? And so, at the end of the day, the question is. How can autonomy facilitate all of these things? Um, but even better, how can we improve them? You know, so that for the future we have a great additional mode of transportation that people can rely on. So very quickly, um, high level about May Mobility for those who don't um, know about May is. Um, you know, May Mobility, we've launched in 10 different cities, and um, we're really looking to bring um, safe, you know, green, accessible um, transportation to communities. Um, the other thing that's quite interesting, you know, we, what we do is we do the software, we do the hardware, we do basically what we call the autonomous driving kit that overlays on the vehicle. And um, we partner with different um, OEMs. One of our, our, our main partners is Toyota, and um, to deliver pretty much a, a full turnkey solution with vehicles, community engagement, operations, support and maintenance. Um, our our long-term goal is to see how we can work with transit agencies and cities to see, you know, to give different flexible models. You know, if you want to own the vehicles, if you want to lease the vehicles, right? But for now, we're, we're offering it as a turnkey. And then... Um, Another thing that's really interesting is that, you know, we're, we're way out of test mode. You know, we, we've operated to, to Anne's point at road speeds, you know, in, um, in cities where pedestrians are, are pretty much crossing. If you think of Ann Arbor, Michigan, with the University of Michigan, we have kids who have headphones crossing, you know, crosswalks, you know, and, um, and really, you know, a, aggressive and complex environments to work through. Um, You'll also notice, unlike um, other autonomous vehicle providers, we don't shy away from adverse weather conditions. Um, we think that in order to make autonomy fully inclusive and accessible, that means it has to go everywhere <laughs> in the U.S., not just in the Sun Belt. And so um, we really try to push ourselves um, to actually operate um, in the real world in those types of conditions. And we also have a very um, unique approach to autonomy and our technology in general with multi-policy decision-making, which basically allows us to sidestep some of the intense um, parameter settings and fine-tuning that's required and instead allow us to really prepare and scale for future situations and awareness. Um, so it really allows us to lift and shift our technology and be able to roll out in different cities fairly quickly um, in, in an efficient manner. And um, last about May here before we talk about just trends and autonomy in general is um, we, we talk a lot about how can we be in it for the long term. And that means working with communities to look at how do we create jobs? You know, when we go into a community, we actually hire locally. We set up shop you know, in that location. Um, how do we reduce demand on infrastructure, right? As, as we move forward, um, the vehicles that we're using right now are hybrid, but we also are very much looking towards electric. How do we work with cities to shape what that entire user experience looks like? Data, we are very cognizant that, you know, transit agencies need NTD data, and we're very fortunate to partner with VIA with, you know, great reporting and data sets there, but also data that's important in terms of making decisions. You know, when is a, v when is a, a service area ready, you know, for, um, to actually pull back 100% and remove a driver if that, you know, community and agency wants to do that in the future and what that might look like and um, reducing congestion and emissions, and also, as I mentioned before, equitable transit is super important to us. Um, we worked with the US DOT on an inclusive design challenge to design automated lifts for autonomous vehicles, and um, and and our deployments, you know, that we're having moving forward. For example, in Minnesota, um, the vehicles are are wheelchair accessible. So. Um, what what should or what will I guess <laughs> you know autonomy look like for the future of public transit? Um, a couple of things here I want to touch on: um, leading with purpose, you know, starting with the problem first, and then backing into it of how um, a, a great you know autonomy um, serviced uh, area 
can it can benefit you know the populations that we're looking to to really help. Um, looking at programs, not projects. You know, really building it into the long term plan and development. You know, for for a city or a community, being accessible and inclusive. I think we talked you know extensively about that. Um, and then starting with people. You know, bringing in partners. I'll stop here a moment just to talk a little bit about this. You know, Anne had mentioned bringing in the university, bringing in VIA, you know, us. I know Anne brought in FTA, you know, but um, all of our deployments, actually, we probably had three or more partners in every single deployment. Um, in Ann Arbor, for example, we um, had a great partner with um, Forum, which is, helps with um, real estate, you know, development in the area, and really working with all of the different partners to figure out, you know, what metrics matter to them, right? And so for Forum, for example, they recognize that having um, additional transportation allowed them to really provide an incentive for their tenants to renew their leases, you know, and so that became something that was interesting. You know, for Grand Rapids, Michigan, one of the, um, the things that we wanted to figure out was, can something like this actually create additional demand, you know, for public transit? And we actually ended up finding out that 24% of the riders who tried autonomy, autonomous vehicles ended up taking public transit for the first time afterwards. So those are the types of metrics that we really want to hone in on in order to figure out how can we marry and harmonize cutting edge autonomy, you know, with um, social impacts and infrastructure for cities to, to really grow and thrive. Um, and then the last one here is scale. Um, this is going to be, you know, something that the industry is really going to look towards. And how do you do it in a way that's responsible, that's safe, that um, brings in the, the feedback from different uh, community stakeholders so that it becomes um, part, again, of the overall mobility ecosystem? And so um, a couple of things here. I just wanted to talk about autonomy, safety, teleassist, and tire sensors. And I don't... Let's see if this will show up. Ah, there we go. So um, this is an interesting picture. On the left-hand side, uh, pretty funny story, actually. Um, this was one of our runs in Arizona. And uh, as we prepare for um, cutting-edge autonomy, we have to prepare for what happens if we don't have a driver in the vehicle, because that is the end goal. Um, and so, you know, the, the vehicle pulled up to this, and there's a big cactus that fell, you know, straight across the road. And the vehicle is kind of sitting there. It's like, okay, what do I do with this? As humans, we would say the same thing. What am I going to do with this, right? And so, and so what happens that is that it's things like these that press us to figure out, okay, from a technology perspective, what do we need to do? So the way we solve for this is something called teleassist. Now, this is very different from teleoperations. If you think teleoperations, you have someone who's situated remotely, who's kind of like almost remote control, right? Here, the vehicle's going this way. This is different. Teleassist is basically the vehicle sends a ping back to a human at a, you know, a remote location and says, um, hey, I, I've encountered something. I am going to move around it. Is that okay? It's a nudge. And then the human says, yes, no, thank you, because the human has eyes on the situation. So from a safety perspective, this is something that we build in in order to, to really um, get the vehicle where it needs to go safely and, and provide a, a good rider experience. Um, the other thing, autonomy and safety. What other things are we doing? Tire sensors. So we partner with Bridgestone, for example, who um, is putting, you know, tire sensors into, the, well, data sensors into the tires to basically, um, you know, monitor tread, you know, monitor tire pressure, and then eventually integrate with our software to, to really direct the vehicle where the vehicle needs to go if you say there's a nail in the vehicle, if there's a dangerous situation, if you have a flat tire, because there are going to be situations where that happens. And so those are the types of things that we're working on. And even, and I'll, Anne will probably talk a little bit about this in a bit when we get to the Q&A, is that from a safety perspective, we're going to be looking at even more opportunities to do those things um, with um, Haas Network, for example, you know, working with emergency vehicles. So those are the types of things that we're, we're really looking forward to from a safety perspective. Um, 
Next up on the um, autonomy and people, I think Megan had talked a little bit about this beforehand, and um, which is our Go Marty project, which just launched today, which we're very excited about. Um, Minnesota DOT was um, very um, keen on looking at how autonomy can work within rural communities, and specifically how seniors and people with disabilities react to autonomy, how they adopt it, and then what we can do, you know, as a technology company to really enhance that experience. So it's super exciting because we talked about start with people first. And for this particular project, we looked at po life points of interest. So there was heavy community engagement at the outset with the community to say, like, where do you want to go? And we design around the places that the community wants to go. So we've identified these points of interest, if you will. And what we did is we we then established the geofenced zone, which is fairly large. It's 35 um, square miles, which is fairly large, you know, significant, right, for for a micro transit geofence zone, and over 70 different stops, you know, for um, this particular community. Um, the other thing that we did was we engaged, you know, local. Um, groups, you know, a disabilities groups, and um, really got their feedback in terms of um, what this could look like, you know, where the stops could be, all of those things, and incorporated that so that we could design a service that would be theirs, you know, that they could own and provide feedback on, and that we could improve over time. And then um, the last slide here, I just wanted to throw out there because we talk about autonomy and accessibility a lot. And we think this is critical to making sure that um, that autonomy and all the investments that have that happened in the technology benefits all. And this is, I wanted to put this here because I wanted to give you an example because people are, are very curious. It's like, well, how, how does this get back to, you know, to Toyota, for example? So what we learn on the ground, you know, we, we actually actually use that information and inform our partners such as Toyota, you know, so that we can we can look at that next generation of vehicles that will have that inclusive lens in mind. And so for this particular, this is a vehicle that we're using, you know, in, in Arlington very soon, we're swapping the Lexuses with the Siennas. Um, and then that's what we're launching today in Minnesota is um, it's a Sienna vehicle. You know, you, all of you have probably seen the Sienna. The difference is that it is designed for autonomy. So it has an autonomous platform on it. Um, in addition to that, we've worked with Brawnability um, to actually make it wheelchair accessible, you know, and compliant. Um, the other thing that's quite interesting, and we talk about the benefits of autonomy, sometimes the benefits of autonomy also um, percolate, you know, through peripheral technologies as well. In this particular case, um, you know, Toyota is very keen on looking at cabin awareness features, being that can we have, you know, a, um, a way to monitor heart rates and breathing within vehicles, you know, because obviously, you know, when if eventually, you know, the driver um, comes out of the vehicle, you know, that ha some there has to be a way to have that awareness. And so um, that technology is then inserted in there as well. So we keep looking for new ways um, as a company, and it is a work in progress. And if any autonomy provider says they've got it figured out, they don't, <laughs> you know, and, and there's a lot to do ahead of us. But what we've been very excited about recently, and even from the feedback that we've received from even Smart and Attain, is that I think more cities and agencies are are looking and saying, you know, we, we do need to do something thing, not just because, you know, it's a cool factor, that that's passe right now, right? The reasoning is because we recognize there are some macroeconomic trends that are happening here that we really need to consider. You know, people want to age in place, right? We have a big aging population. We have a generation who um, does not want to own personal vehicles and wants to, you know, to take shared rides or use different means of transportation. Um, we also know that uh, we spoke with the Department of Transportation earlier, and um, they're very keen on seeing how this works with rural communities, primarily because they said 50% um, of the agencies within, you know, that under their umbrella have, um, have 
have resorted to service cuts because they cannot hire fast enough, you know, and that labor shortage is going to continue. To that end, we also mentioned the term responsibility is that we also need to make sure we're working with cities and agencies to figure out from a workforce development standpoint, how can we find ways to actually reskill and retrain, you know, people, whether it's the driver who becomes an ambassador or a teleoperator, right? Or whether um, they're mechanics, you know, who we can retrain in order to service, you know, this, you know, autonomous landscape moving forward. How do we do that? And, and a lot of agencies and cities actually have brought in the universities or local universities universities to help us figure that aspect out. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there. I know there's probably a lot of questions and we'll, we'll get into a discussion here, but um, we are very excited about the future of autonomy. We're very excited about innovation, um, but we're most excited about the transformative um, aspects of it. There's still a lot to figure out, but we do believe that this is, you know, this is going to, to make a, a very profound impact to the future of, of transportation. Matt, do you want to bring us back on? All right. Well, thank you all. Um, appreciate all the the insights. Um, there is a lot of questions, and I would encourage everybody to uh, enter them and ask a in the ask a question box at any time. But before we get to the audience Q and A, I've got a couple of follow ups myself. That's the benefit of being the moderator. Uh, so let's start with uh, partnerships and collaboration. Um, we just this call alone. I mean, we've got three stakeholders involved on the call. Uh, Daisy, you mentioned in your portion of the presentation that there are at least three partners in each deployment. Um, so I'd like to start with Anne and, and then open it up to uh, Daisy and Megan. But can you touch on the importance of these partnerships and the collaboration required, um, as well as, as loop in the, the funding for these de deployments? Um, so Anne, I'd love to start with you. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, yes, I think collaboration and partnerships are hugely important. Um, you know, it's uh, I'm I'm a planner. I uh, work for the city. I don't have a lot of the technical expertise that the folks who are actually, you know, deploying and running these services do, like Megan and Daisy's team. So um, we feel like it's been very helpful and has enabled us to be more successful by reaching out to industry partners, picking their brains, finding opportunities to collaborate with them. Uh, the university partnerships are also very important. We're really lucky to have a strong university uh, in our backyard. And um, I think that that's a, a direct link to our success with funding as well. Um, external funding has been very important for us to be able to um, launch and sustain these services. So the FTA funding, one of the things that they were looking for was a lot of data collection and analysis. And so by partnering with a university, we tapped into faculty and students who have been able to do really robust um, analysis of performance metrics and ridership trends and all those sorts of things. Um, and I think those partnerships, as we continue to learn from them and grow, have helped us le uh, leverage future funding to be able to continue the service as well. Excellent. And Daisy, Megan, would love to get your thoughts on this as well. Sure. Megan, do you want to go first? Of course. So I think um, exactly as... And said, partnerships are critical to our AV services, and we're very fortunate to have two incredible partners on the call right now. Um, and I think exactly what Anne's saying, I think the partnership is truly end-to-end. -end. So everything from the initial program idea to the service design. So what are we trying to achieve um, in terms of transit goals, in terms of rider objectives, um, and how does that overlay with uh, transit planning and AV capabilities and actually designing the service itself to identifying funding and applying for funding and going after funding and crafting a very strong application narrative to then actually once we've aligned on, okay, this is the service we're going to pursue, the actual pre-launch activities, as, as Anne alluded to, the heavy, heavy tech requirements of integrating VIA's technology, for example, with May Mobility's technology, the pre-launch community engagement. So going around to all important community stakeholders um, and identifying uh, barriers to service usage and how to remediate those. 
And then as Anne alluded to, the, the, the actual continuation and the long-term sustainability of the service, both in terms of, okay, how do we continue to fund this service over multiple years? And how do we make sure that we're learning and soaking everything we can up from the service in terms of data, in terms of um, more on the ground rider feedback and making sure that it's influencing our joint product pipelines and how we think about autonomous mobility for years to come. So I would say across the entire end to end cycle of a service, both from start, so the idea conception all the way to, okay, we've launched a service. Now, how do we continue to optimize it? Mm -hmm. Partnerships have been critical, both in terms of our AV partners like May Mobility, as well as our transit partners like Arlington. Daisy, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll keep mine short because there's a lot of great questions here. Um, I, I think for, for us, you know, it's, it's like par partners across the board to, to I think, Anne and, and uh, Megan's point. Um, I'll, I'll kind of separate it out, right? From a technology perspective, we're looking for partners who can help us get to what we talked about before. How do we make the service safer? How do we make it more accessible, right? Um, how, how do we make it more reliable, affordable? Um, those are kind of the North Stars that we start off for first, and then we back into them. So, you know, safety, for example, you know, we, it's interesting as the evolution of AV goes on, you know, it's not just the autonomy stack that needs to evolve. It's also, you know, what's available on the market, right, with the vehicles themselves. And so we may you know, in some ways be ahead on the autonomy stack, but the vehicles aren't there yet and vice versa. Sometimes the vehicles are there, you know, in some areas we're not quite there yet. So it's kind of how do we bridge those two things? And so we're looking for technology providers who can help enhance the user experience. I, you know, I see a lot of questions around accessibility here um, and I'll, I'll maybe use that as an example. We're thinking ahead is that right now, um, you know, Anne had mentioned operating 80% or more in autonomy. What that means is we're, we're operating at level four, which is basically autonomy. We have an operator behind the wheel, but 80% means basically the operator is not touching the vehicle. Like, you know, basically hands off the wheel, yeah, the steering wheel. And so it is operating fully in autonomous mode. Now, we also recognize that, you know, from an accessibility perspective for seniors, you know, um, you know, people with cognitive disabilities, right, visually impaired, there's a whole, you know, set of things that we need to take a look at to make sure that we're being inclusive and equitable. So um, for cities, you know, we'll be okay, you know, let's have that operator still there and, and be able to help, you know, in that manner. But for the future, it may end up being, we ha might have ambassadors who are sitting there and doing that role, right? Um, and then maybe further as the technology enhances and the experience, you know, enhances, we start embedding different types of technology to help that as well. So what I'm saying, it's it's um, an evolution. I don't think it's you know, tomorrow, we'll figure it all out. But what we're learning every day is that we need to put ourselves in those difficult situations so that we know what comes up, right? And we need to educate ourselves by talking with transit agencies, you know, by, um, by listening to accessibility groups. You know, it, it's interesting. I think it was in Arlington, wasn't it? And where we had the women's basketball team, I think, you yeah. know, where um, we actually invited um, women's basketball team, you know, there, it was a wheelchair, <laughs> you know, wheel, um, a women's basketball team who, who basically were all in wheelchairs, you know, so wheelchair players who, um, who actually tested out our vehicles. And, um, and it was super interesting because we got their feedback about the ride and how they did. But I took that um, snippet of information to another group you know, of, of riders who um, at a United Spinal event that I went to in DC, and I talked about this. And the reaction to them was so interesting to me. They said, wow, that's really cool. And I said, well, why, you know, why is it cool? He said, because one of the biggest um, areas of concern is, you know, the headspace, right? And they felt it was great that we were getting basketball players because they're taller <laughs> and, you know, the headspace was there. So it's nuances like that, that um, sometimes we haven't encountered yet, or we need to encounter in order to make it better. So, um, so those are the types of partnerships we need. So it's, it's technology partners, 
it's people partners, it's specialists in certain areas. You know, AARP has approached us and said, we want to learn more. We want to invest. We want to figure out what's going on because they want to know too. So it does take a village, <laughs> but, but I think um, the outcome is going to be so much better for everyone if it takes a village. Excellent. Um, and then on uh, the topic of kind of looking toward the future, you mentioned at the, the beginning of your presentation, Daisy, that, you know, things have really picked up, the pace has really picked up over the past two years and, and things have fallen into place. So looking to the future, um, what's next? And Anne, if you want to talk uh, on the, the provider perspective, and then we can go over to Daisy and Megan uh, for their perspective as well. Yeah, sure. So um, a couple of thoughts. Well, lots of thoughts. Um, I think there's lots of what's what next on all of our minds. But um, for our rapid service specifically to start there, um, we have been successful in receiving additional funding from our local council of governments for two more years of deployment. So, um, you know, really fundamentally, we see this as a an ongoing service that we want to sustain and, and make it part of everyday um, transportation options for people in Arlington. So that's kind of a, a big important what's next, right? Normalizing AV, continuing to keep it operating. Um, Daisy mentioned a couple of things that we'll be working on in Arlington. So um, using devices that are placed in our first responder vehicles to allow um, those first responders to communicate with the AVs and let them know if they need to take a detour or get out of the way of an ambulance or something like that. And then also the teleassist. Um, so starting in Arlington to move towards situations where we can remove that human operator from behind the driver's seat. Uh, so those are some of the exciting what next with Rapid. I think more broadly, um, you know, there's really important conversations happening around um, accessibility. Um, equity of, of access to transit for all users. Um, and so that's something that we continue to work on in Arlington, um, not just on the ground. We're also looking into the air and talking about drone um, operations, both for, for freight delivery as well as passengers. So there's a lot of exciting things coming in this space. Um, and, and our perspective is always, you know, how can it be useful to, you know, our, our residents and visitors? How can we, um, you know, create more opportunities and more resources for people who need them in their everyday lives. Excellent. And uh, Megan, Daisy, do you have anything more to, to add from your perspective? Sure. I think over the past few years, we've seen the maturity of AV public transit deployments increase and expand. Um, and while they were useful in their time, I think we're past the point of short-term you know, three to six month demonstrations with fairly small fleets, say one to two vehicles in private enclosed settings. And I think oppositely, we've matured to multi-year long-term services that are getting people where they need to go. Um, and I think it, at VIA, at least we look across this maturity in, in a few different factors. So one, as Anne talked about, is the duration. So not just six months, but multiple years and rapid is the perfect example of that of it's going to be a, a three-year service um at least hopefully um after it's three years of funding that that Angie talked about um is up and and also fleet size so increasing from one to two vehicles to five to ten to fifteen um as well as locational breadth so um go marty is a great example of expanding avs not just to urban and suburban locations but also rural locations that have particularly harsh weather conditions um, and, and the transit tech component, right, of, of on-demand and shared microtransit, but then increasingly expanding additional complex features. So things like mixed-use fleet, multimodal integrations, intermodal as well. So in the same app, can we enable riders to book and view connecting public transit schedules um, with the same app they're, that they're using to book um, their autonomous vehicles? And then, as, as Anne mentioned um, and Daisy mentioned earlier, increasingly seeing um, system-wide integration. So how can we integrate the service and the autonomous vehicles to the broader infrastructure um, that enables the, the city to um, advance more broadly? So things like emergency service and integrations um, and, and smart traffic. And then finally, I think we're seeing um, maturity along the lines of autonomous vehicle capabilities, which I'll, I'll hand over to Daisy and let Daisy speak to. But whether it's increased speeds or um, the ability to service different types of riders, 
Um, this only increases the use cases and the ability for um, us as partners to deploy autonomous vehicles for an increased use of, of, of applications. So Daisy, I'll hand it over to you. No, I think you and Anne covered a lot of it, <laughs> so I'll just be very brief. I mean, the, the big thing for the future is how do we make it more, um, I think, scalable, right, within communities? And and really to, to Anne, just doubling down on what Anne and Megan said, is that how do we look at the different use cases where it makes sense, you know, to bring in autonomy? And, and um, we can do that route scouting and route planning around those certain areas and, and expand, you know, certain zones where it makes sense, but also be able to push to the edge of, of, of autonomy safety first, but still push it, you know, so that we can understand how it operates in different environments. And, um, you know, we're, we're excited about, you know, those things for sure, because scalability is going to be that next big push. And um, to, to Megan's point, we've already seen a huge difference in terms of interest that um, people are looking, you know, people are talking, you know, double digits in terms of number of vehicles they want to start off with. And in some cases, triple digits, you know, where um, it's it's fairly transformative. These are projects that they're looking for, you know, not just for next year, but for three to five years out, um, you know, and then working with us to figure out, wow, if we're going to put electric charging stations in the city, what do we need to understand, you know, when it comes to autonomy? If we want to, you know, do traffic um, signal prioritization, you know, how can we connect that into autonomy, you know, and, and what does that mean for autonomous vehicles? Um, if we are to re redesign curbsides, right, you know, for people who need uh, wheelchair accessibility, how do we incorporate that in the context of autonomy? So those are the things that I think I'm, you know, I think we're excited about here at May and um, really being able to create regionalized areas, you know, of, of autonomy that can um, really grow and, and really bring benefits to the community. Wonderful. So we'll move on to, we've got about uh, eight to 10 minutes here for audience Q&A and um, the audience did not disappoint. Thank you very much for everybody who <laughs> submitted questions. So we'll start off with just a few kind of uh, nitty gritty questions for Anne on, on the rapid service. Uh, so the average uh, times for pickup, average distance traveled, uh, and if you could clarify what acceptance means, I know it's kind of a, a two-parter <laughs> there for Anne. Yeah, no worries. Um, so our average wait times for pickup, um, they they ranged fairly significantly. I think we had, um, you know, depending on time of day, if demand is low, you know, there were some four to five minute ETAs for pickup um, and they ranged up to a high of around 15 minutes. But I think our average overall was right around 10 minutes, uh, which is pretty in line with what we see for our broader rideshare service. And I think, um, you know, certainly uh, an acceptable level for, for most riders. Um, and then distance traveled, you know, as I mentioned, our service area is one square mile. Um, we, the May Mobility team actually mapped a total of over 18 lane miles within that one square mile. So there were a lot of different um, options for street routes and networks for the vehicles to take to be able to get people from their pickup location to their drop off location using the most efficient route um, and also incorporating shared rides. So but I think our average distance traveled was a, between one and two miles total for, for rides. Um, and then acceptance rates were um, how often people, when presented with the choice between a human-driven vehicle or the AV, chose the AV. So we were seeing acceptance rates of over 75%, 75 to 90% of the time when people got that choice, they chose the AV, uh, which we, we saw as a great success. All right, well, and that kind of springboards into another question directed for Anne. Um, is that, you know, Arlington isn't known as a, a public transit hub. Uh, so so how has the public adoption been toward this AV transit? I mean, you just mentioned a 75% adoption rate in your earlier answer. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've seen a lot of support and success with, with our rideshare service and with our AV service. Um, you know, it is a it's a challenging position for us because we haven't had transit in the past. So we don't have a population of people who 
are used to being able to rely on transit. Um, I think when we first launched our services, we, we've had um, people who you know have a gap and needed that transportation and were very early adopters. Um, but then trying to move on to more choice riders who maybe don't necessarily need to use public transit, but want to because it's more convenient or um, they want to check out the AV technology. And then once they do, you know, we, we have really high satisfaction ratings from our riders. Um, we see a lot of repeat riders on the AV service. So people take a ride and then they keep coming back and riding again. We had some super users who took over 100 rides, I think, in our first year of deployment. Um, so so overall, you know, we've definitely seen a lot of support from um, from the public here for these services. That's great. Um, and then we are getting, I'm going to try to group a couple of these questions together. We're getting a lot of um, uh, recruitment and workforce uh, centered uh, questions. So I guess, Daisy, this would be for you is, can you, sure. you mentioned, you know, you kind of set up shop in those communities. Uh, mm -hmm. So can you go into a little more detail about the recruitment efforts and the, the development efforts? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, when we launch in a city, we um, set up a shop there because we need a place for our autonomous vehicles and then we hire locally. So hiring locally means basically the our AV safety operators, you know, that we hire um, are from the area. Usually our site supervisors, you know, are, are in the area as well. And, um, you know, they they run the service and um, we recruit from different places. You know, sometimes there have been previous drivers, sometimes they're university students. We have a a lot of seniors actually who, who really enjoy driving um, and learning you know about autonomy and um, and then they go through you know their checks um, that through our third party um, you know recruitment um, agency and these are checks that we go through you know for for any type of you know publicly funded uh, you know engagement um, that's required so so that's what we do there um, in addition to that as I mentioned before is that you know workforce development is very important to us from a long-term perspective is um, we've worked with um, technical and community colleges in the area you know as well as local high schools and in different areas for local high schools it's more advocacy to really um, promote you know the stem you know, subjects and and really encourage, you know, um, students to look at this as a, as, a, as a pathway from a career development and also to, to be able to stay, you know, with the community and not leave the community. Um, with technical colleges and universities, we've been working with them to really more study kind of how this is working, you know, how can we look at the next step of um, where do those operators go, you know, after, you know, we go into to driver out because the idea is to really create new jobs, you know, in the area as well, you know, not to remove jobs. And, and so we are very cognizant of that. And um, it's interesting, we were talking with an agency in Florida, you know, Megan's very aware of this. And that particular agency told us that, um, that they're looking to eventually transform that experience with the end autonomous vehicle and after you know because there's such a shortage of of uh, drivers you know or operators from a fixed route perspective they would like to see us move the av operators to be fixed route vehicle you know operators you know and move them over and then have like an ambassador you know be there to help with um seniors and people with disabilities and that's his model he's like i what he's looking at it very broadly which i thought was actually i was like oh wow that's really interesting and certainly worth looking at because you want to have a very fluid workforce that can move between different modes of transportation so how can we do that and then and then also the other aspect is eventually we really want to to let others you know um help us you know actually maintain the vehicle support the vehicles all of those things and so um looking at pathways to that as well whether it's designing programs to to working with universities on specific training you know initiatives so those are some of the things that we're doing on that side Sounds good. Um, I uh, so those eight to ten minutes just kind of flew by very rapidly here. <laughs> um, so we uh, the panelists have agreed to go through the. There's a lot of questions that did not get answered, um, and there will be follow up on that aspect of it. So if we didn't get to your questions, um, apologies for uh, the time constraints that we have here. 
Um, so I do want to bring this to a close and thank Daisy and Anne and Megan uh, for spending sharing your expertise with us, your experiences with us. Uh, and on behalf of Mass Transit and Endeavor Business Media, we'd also like to thank Main Mobility for sponsoring this presentation. We appreciate that as well. Uh, stay on the lookout for a follow-up email uh, with on-demand information on this article. Again, slides can be downloaded in the resources tab. And we appreciate everyone joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone.